All right, so we are looking at uh, day three of PFT 119 today. We've got uh, uh, the muscular system. So we're wrapping up the kinetic chain. Um, after we get this out of the way, we will have the entire human movement system covered. Um, and then we can start really diving into the um, actual kinesiology, like the, the movement side of things, which will be really fun. So uh, again, sort of the same purpose of today's lesson as it has been uh, to give you guys the understanding of the kinetic chain as a whole. Uh, and today, primarily, we are spending our time in that muscular system. Uh, and then this has been, you know, true of, of every lesson so far, but it's especially true today. Uh, we will definitely describe how this system, the muscles in particular, uh, respond and adapt to exercise. Um, so love starting out with the definition. The muscular system is going to be defined as uh, a series of muscles uh, that are going, that are, that are moving the skeleton, right? So you actually have three different types of muscle inside your body. You've got cardiac muscle, that's your heart muscle. You've got, uh, uh, smooth muscle, which is like the muscles of your organs that are kind of like moving food around and stuff like that. But the one that's really relevant to us is going to be what we call skeletal muscle and it moves the skeleton. That's its job, right? Um, so it's, you know, each muscle is considered its own little individual organ and all these little organs work together to kind of manipulate and move around these levers that we talked about yesterday. And it is all under the control of the nervous system, uh, like we talked about on day one. Um, so it's a series of muscles that move everything around. Their job is to, like what a muscle does, uh, is it's a compilation of a whole bunch of like little fibers all wrapped together. So it's like layers on layers on layers on layers. Uh, and they're all wrapped together, being controlled by the nervous system uh, in these like bundles. And what's really cool about that, uh, what's really cool about that bundle arrangement is that it makes them really, really good at contracting and relaxing. They can uh, by binding proteins together and then pulling them in a certain direction, it creates this sliding action. And so the fibers actually slide across one another. They get kind of stacked up kind of like that. And that's actually why you see your muscles kind of bunch up, right? The way that they do. Um, you're seeing that sort of in real time, right? Um, you know, and so like when this fiber contracts and that fiber contracts at the same time, your muscle is essentially uh, generating internal tension, right? So muscles generate this internal tension. Uh, and if that tension is greater than the amount of like whatever resistive force it's sort of dealing with, well, then the muscle is going to shorten and it's going to overcome that resistive force uh, in order to manipulate our bones and, and move us around, you know? So like right now, I don't have anything in my hands. So the only amount of force that's like, you know, however much my arm weighs, that's being pulled by gravity, right? Uh, it's not really all that much force. I can, you know, generate easily enough internal tension to kind of move this around pretty easily, right? But if I had like 50 pound dumbbells in both hands, right? You know, I'm gonna come, I'm definitely not keeping those arms up. Uh, <laughs> that's a little bit more than I can lateral raise. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, by about uh, double. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to be able to generate enough internal tension to sort of manipulate that. And so um, that's sort of what we define as strength. It's the amount of internal tension that your muscles can can do. And so when we're talking about this, one of the things that we're going to talk about, uh, a, a term that we are going to use a bunch, is we're going to be talking a lot about muscle fibers today, muscle fiber anatomy. And what a muscle fiber is, is it's sort of the fancy way of describing a muscle. It's a muscle cell, you know, it's just the fancy way of saying it. In the same way that we said like a neuron is a nerve cell uh, and like an osteon is a bone cell. So a muscle fiber uh, is a, a muscle cell, right? And so, like I said, if you, if you picture, you know, a classic like animal cell, you know, just go back to high school biology, we would always draw the cells like this, you know, we would just kind of draw these little circles and they'd have all these little things, these little organelles inside of them. Um, and this is a general animal cell. You actually don't have any cells that actually look exactly like this because this doesn't have any special shapes in it, which means that it doesn't do anything special. You know, for instance, like your skin cells, they look just like this. They have all of these things in it, except they actually look like this. Um, you know, when you actually look at them, uh, they have all the normal stuff that you're going to see. 
where'd that picture go? There it is. Um, except that there's also like little glands in there and like little pieces of fat. It's like all the normal pieces, but in a very different organization, you know? Or if you look at like a bone cell, right? Um, you know, it's gonna have a lot of the normal stuff, right? That looks very similar. There's a big nucleus. They're not drawing all the pieces there, but it's just very long and flat and kind of hard, right? But, uh, or a nerve cell, you know? Um, you know, again, all the normal stuff inside uh, this section, but then all the special stuff as well. So muscle fibers are no different. They, they've got all the normal stuff inside of them, but they've got some special materials as well. When you look at a muscle fiber, uh, it is a muscle, it is a cell just like any other, except that it is arranged with all these special little proteins in it like this. Um, and there's these big long rods that run from end to end within the cell. So imagine that normal classic biology animal cell, but now take these rods and stretch it from end to end. So instead of having like the cell be like a blob like this, turn it into sort of like a tube, you know? I mean, honestly, you, you make it kind of shape it like this instead, kind of like a tube. Uh, and then stretch these little fibers from end to end. These are little contractile proteins. And that's where the magic of a muscle cell really happens. These little proteins right here binding to one another and moving things around so that they can slide. That way the cell can be this long. And then when it decides to contract, it can be this long. And then it can relax back to its original length. So it contracts and relaxes and contracts. Meanwhile, there's another one stacked right over here. And it shortens at the same time. So imagine all, if you had like a chain of like a hundred people all tied together, and then all of you at the same time pulled your elbows in like this, that chain would get a lot shorter. And then if you just relax back to full length, that's exactly what's happening. This muscle fiber is contracting with that muscle fiber, which is contracting with that one, but that one, they're all contracting at the same time. And then the muscle itself, like the big you know, organ that we see, like the, you know, steak that you're eating, whatever, right? All of that contracts and it all gets a lot shorter. Um, and that's sort of what we're going to be describing today. So uh, muscle fiber is the fancy term for an individual muscle cell. And uh, so when we're looking at the arrangement of, of how our muscles are, right? Like I said, uh, they are bundles of bundles of bundles. So your muscles are arranged into these really large bundles with these really, um, these different layers, right? The outermost layer is what's called the fascia, okay? So the outermost layer is this connective tissue that kind of surrounds your muscles. It's not really contractile the same way that like muscles are. It maybe has like a little bit of contractile force sometimes, but if you look at like muscle fascia, um, it's sort of this thin membrane that's around the outside of your muscles. And you've actually seen fascia before if you've ever cooked like a chicken breast and it has that like silver skin. Or if you've ever cooked like a steak and it's got that like kind of webbing, you know, that, that silver skin stuff, that's actually the fascia of the muscle that you're eating. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not, not the, the best part of things. Oftentimes you'll kind of cut that off, but this is kind of what that looks like inside your body. It's this kind of webbing and it's there to make sure that your muscles stay uh, in the proper sort of alignment and that they don't kind of get stuck to any other parts of the body. So that's not really just like, you know, that's, that's not the muscle itself, but it is this outer sort of wrapping around the outside of our, our muscles there. So that's the fascia, that's the outermost layer. Uh, and it is connective tissue similar to, you know, tendons and ligaments and that that has very limited blood flow and doesn't repair very quickly. And so if you do mess up your fascia, it can tighten up. And that's where we start to get problems like plantar fasciitis, for instance, uh, which people will describe as sort of like a painful burning, stabbing sensation in the bottom of their foot because the webbing on their foot just tightens up and then that muscle starts rubbing on the heel bone. Um, or uh, or uh, shin splits, that's, 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 that's inflammation of the fascia and the shins. So, you know, uh, the next layer, we start to zoom in. Now we get into the actual sort of muscle itself. The outermost layer of the muscle is what we call the epimesium. That's the outer walls of the muscle fibers there. Um, I always spelled that wrong. Uh, so that's like the, the <laughs> I always spell it wrong. I'm, I'm, I, we got to remember I'm a biology teacher, not a math, not an English teacher. 
<laughs> uh, and so there we go. There you can see like this, this outermost layer right here that's sort of surrounding the muscle. It's like a wrapper around the muscle uh, that is bundling together all of these fibers right here. Um, so that outermost layer of the actual muscle itself, that's the epimesium. It's around the, the sort of the epicenter, right? Uh, and then the next most layer, um, the next layer is going to be uh, your paramecium. And your paramecium is wrapping around what's called a fascicle. Now, fascicle is a big important term here. You can actually see this right here, this bundling is a fascicle, right? And you can see inside of it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 muscle cells within that fascicle. And that's what a fascicle is. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells, okay? All sort of bound together. Um, and so there's an outer layer on that called the paramecium that is, you know, sort of representing the walls of that fascicle, right? Um, and then, like I said, it, what a fascicle is, it's a bundle of muscle fibers, right? This one right here, uh, you can see this is a, a very, you know, we kind of pulled a fascicle out so you can see it. And again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So like 20, 25, 20 to 25 uh, muscle cells inside this fascicle all bound together, right? Um, so uh, we need to have like a layer around the outside of the cell because all cells have a, a membrane around the outside of them. And so that final layer that we're talking about, the innermost layer is going to be the endomecium. Uh, endo does mean innermost. Uh, and that's where we're going to see that. So those are all the like layers, right? So if we go in reverse, right? We've got an individual muscle cell here. And it's got a wrapper around the outside of it that we're going to call the endomecium. That's the cell wall. And then that muscle fiber is going to be bound up together with a whole bunch of other muscle fibers into what is called a fascicle. And that fascicle is going to be uh, bound together in its outermost layer uh, that we call the paramecium. And then that fascicle is going to be bound together with that fascicle, which is bound together with that fascicle, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. And that all comes together to make up the muscle itself, which has the epimecium around the outside. And then there's going to be some outermost fascia surrounding that whole thing. So again, it is a bundle of a bundle of a bundle, right? Uh, and that's a really important thing to remember when we go back to that concept of like function following form, right? Things look a certain way so that they can act a certain way. Well, we want to be able to have something that's really good at contracting and relaxing. So having like bundles allows us to contract maybe half of the fibers, but not all of them. And that way, you know, uh, we can regulate our the strength of our contractions. And so if I go to like grab something that's relatively light and I squeeze my arm, you know, I don't have to like really bulge my muscles all that much because maybe I'm only recruiting 20% of my fibers, right? And now, you know, like that's why they're all sort of bound together. Um, but if I need like a maximal strength contraction, you know, I'm going to recruit all of those fibers, you know? Um, which is why I always think of, you know, like, it's always like one of the most impressive parts of the, the friggin' MCU. When you look at like what good shape Chris Evans was in, where he's got the friggin' helicopter, uh, <laughs> that bit where he's friggin' holding it and he's just like trying to bicep curl a helicopter. <laughs> um, and you just see like his arm looks like it's going to explode. That moment is great. Like that moment's so cool. And you can actually see like, it's just a maximum effort, like, you know, thing. He's using all the fibers, you know? <laughs> like, uh, whereas like a minimal contraction, not so much. <laughs> um, so all of that is gonna end and it's all gonna come together. And before it inserts onto a bone, uh, it is going to become a tendon at the very end. So yesterday we were talking about ligaments as connective tissue, right? It's connective tissue that connects uh, bones to other bones. Well, tendons are the same thing. They attach muscles to bone. They are also connective tissue. They just work a little bit differently. So your muscle will sort of all come together and these fibers will start to harden and stiffen uh, and be very, very stiff and tense. And then that will become a tendon before it will actually insert onto a bone. And so uh, what tendons are, uh, they are connective tissue 
that attach muscles to bones and they provide the anchor so that the muscle can actually produce that force on the bones and actually move the skeletal system around. So again, they attach muscles to bones. Again, they have very limited blood flow and due to that limited blood flow, your tendons are going to repair much, much more slowly. So again, my love-hate relationship with this picture here, you can see this is a ligament, it's attaching bone to bone. And then this is a tendon here. This is your quad tendon. This picture makes it look as if the quad tendon grabs this bone here. And then there's like another tendon that starts down here and you know goes like this, but that would be bone to bone. So that's actually not a very accurate description. If you actually look at your, um, if you actually look at this tendon here, uh, it actually looks more like this. You can see that the bone is actually sort of embedded behind it, right? And that's a more accurate description of, of sort of, or an accurate drawing of, of what that actually looks like. It, it, the tendon runs over top of the bone and grabs here. Uh, because if it only grabbed here, it would just move this this way, right? If you look at the way this muscle would pull, it would just take this bone and just rip it this way. Uh, and that's not what happens. We need to move the shin bone. We need the shin bone to extend forward whenever we contract this. And so this muscle runs down and it inserts right over here. Um, so again, kind of a love-hate relationship with this picture. I love it because it's a, it's a great you know, photo, but um, sometimes it gets a little confusing looking. Um, so like I said, they don't repair very quickly. You know, like I'm actually dealing with a little bit of that. I felt like that this morning I played my you know, ultimate game yesterday. And I woke up this morning, and my hamstring is like, feels really achy and really sore. And I was like, you know, uh, it feels like I might have a little bit of hamstring uh, sort of tendonitis um, because I've been doing, you know, heavy deadlifts this month and I did sprints yesterday, you know, and I haven't been taking a lot of recovery. And so now it's like my tendons are having a hard time keeping up with my muscles. Yeah, that takes a while. That takes like up to like maybe two to three weeks sometimes. If you let it rest, maybe a week will be, you know, better, but you got to work your way around it because I experienced that a lot here on my tennis elbow. Yeah. That's due yeah, to, uh, I, I usually feel it like when I'm doing close grip pull-ups, either pronator yeah. or uh, not so much this way, mostly yeah. this way. But that's because I've noticed that I let myself dead hang all the way down, which makes mm -hmm. it worse. So for me, when I do this now, I just kind of like have it a little bit, like just like kind of like a 45 degree. I don't, I don't lock out too much and then come back up. For that sure. way I don't yeah. have to feel like the tendon being stressed out even more, you know, yeah. get more inflammation. So, yeah, I just recovered from this like about a month ago now. So it took a Pain while. Pain in the butt, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just like, you know, icing it a little bit here and there. Uh, you know, stretching it out, promoting some blood flow, um, get some nutrients in there and it'll repair up. But like, you know, that's the, that's the price of, you know, sort of the really pushing yourself, you know, this is like the, this is like my, where I'm trying to peak this year, you know, this is, I'm yeah. trying to get the heaviest lifts out of the way right now. So I can recover by the end of the year and hopefully do some more heavy lifting in like February of next year. So I've kind of got my year planned out, you know? Um, but sometimes it's, you know, athletes at the end of the season that's when they're always you know they're worn out right uh, like i want there to be more nfl like i do you know what i mean like i love football but i get it like one game a week we not that many weeks if the season was if the nfl season was as long as like freaking baseball can you imagine the we've had no players left at the end of the year yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and it wouldn't be their muscles it would be their tendons you know, yeah. or their, or their ligaments or their brains with the oh guy. I mean, I'm not talking about that or I'm going to get sad. <laughs> I was just talking about this the other day. I love football. So it's so bad for humans. That's Hi. sport, but I do love it. And I, it's like the guiltiest of my pleasures, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's what tendons are. So, uh, all right, guys, let's dive into the uh, let's dive into the microanatomy here. So, um, we are going to break down muscle cells because they do ask you about this uh, on your test. This is some of the heavy sort of like I said. You know, you're going to have actually. You know, I haven't done this in a while, so I'll do it, I'll do it right now. But just to show you guys, if you look at your NASA exam blueprint, um, they actually put this up on the internet, so you guys can always download this whenever you want. Um, but this is what the blueprint looks like. It's 
um, 15% of your questions, and remember, it's a 100 question exam, right? 15% um, of them are going to be from basic science and nutrition. 15% uh, is going to be from uh, behavior coaching and uh, uh, client relations. 16% is from assessments. This is why kinesiology is so important. So you can understand, you know, when someone moves this way, what does it mean? What muscles are doing that? That's assessment. 20% uh, is program design, which is why we spend so much time on program design. Then 24% is exercise technique. They're not saying it here, but that's literally also program design. <laughs> um, so really it's like 44% is all about understanding sets and reps and tempo and things like that, which is why we revisit that so often here at Sochi. Uh, and then 10% of it is professional development. So it'll be a little bit about like marketing and, um, you know, hey, how, how do you keep your, you know, self updated with the exams? It's like you got to do your continuing education units, you know, answering a couple questions about that. So these are the domains. And by the way, every personal trainer, uh, NASM actually didn't create these rules. Um, they created their version of the test, but every personal training certification has to cover these six domains as is stated by the um, NCCS or whatever. Um, so, I mean, you're only gonna have 15 out of hundred questions come from this major science stuff, you know? But the more clearly you understand this cellular part of things, um, the easier it's going to be to understand like, you know, how these muscles grow. And it, it is sort of, you know, when I'm describing things to my clients, um, it is the kind of thing that like, I like to think kind of sets me apart from your basic trainer that doesn't really understand some of these concepts. Because I honestly think that there are some really great trainers out there that don't necessarily go really deep into the science stuff you know like they're just like they're really terrific motivators they're really terrific like high energy trainers um and it's like wow where'd you study it's like you know what honestly like i just started working out myself and i kind of got into it and i just do what other people did with me and you know what i think works i actually don't have a ton against that um but i do know you can get a lot further in your career by being like that plus all this other stuff. You're just going to have, you're more fluid. You know, you're, you can do more things. That trainer is going to be really great at working with clients. Um, we're going to be really great at 20 other things, you know, plus that. So that's why we're going to, we're going to really dive in here. Um, we're going to get into this sort of cellular biology part here. So um, really quickly, just talking, uh, just to, to, again, kind of go back to your classic sort of animal cell just to kind of give you a brief review because, you know, it's, it's been a while since high school, you know, <laughs> uh, but if we're looking at uh, this sort of classic sort of structure here of, of just your classic biology animal cell, in the dead center, you've got what's called the nucleus, right? The nucleus is kind of like the head hunch. It's the brain of the cell that tells the cell how to operate and how to grow and how to reproduce. Um, it contains all of your DNA. And your DNA is the blueprint that sort of tells your body how to make U-shaped stuff, you know? Um, uh, it's what tells some people's hair to be brown, some people how to be, you know, where to be tall, what, how their muscles should grow. You know, like me, I don't have like a lot of like naturally occurring large muscle DNA, you know? <laughs> I come from a long line of long, lanky, skinny people, you know, runners, <laughs> um, Fight, flighters, not fighters, you know? <laughs> like, um, and so like, you know, that's just how my sort of DNA, that's, that's how the nucleus is, uh, which contain my DNA. I've sort of told my body to grow. Um, you will also see uh, this, uh, they call it the endoplasmic reticulum here, uh, which is this like material that has these little dots on it. Um, that is actually where the, what are called ribosomes, which are uh, actually assembling the DNA. So the nucleus has like the instructions for how to do things and then it tells the ribosomes to put it all together. And so they assemble that all in this sort of webbing that's surrounding the nucleus here. Um, and then you've also got some smooth endoplasmic reticulum that does some other stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, you'll notice here, uh, where is it? So see how this, this stuff right here, they call it the cytoplasm. Uh, it's kind of pointing to nothing, right? Like it's not actually pointing to any 
funky little shaped thing in here. Uh, and that's because cytoplasm is the fluid, what it's referring to is the fluid within your cells, okay? Um, all of the cells in your body, you know, we are mostly water, right? Like humans, we're about 80% water, right? Um, most of that is the fluid within our cells. Your cells are these, it's this wet, swampy environment, you know? Um, and so that's very much what we are seeing inside here. So we call that the cytoplasm. And then you can see these little, they look like potato bugs, these little like bug looking things here. Um, those are your mitochondria. And the mitochondria are producing energy within the cell. So that's really like your, you know, it's the powerhouse of the cells. We always hear people say um, that is the power plant that is giving your cell all of its stuff. Now there's some other ones in here, but those are the areas that are most important to us. Now, like I said, muscle fibers, they look a little bit different. Um, they're going to be shaped slightly differently because they have to act differently, right? So if we look at a muscle fiber, um, it's going to look something kind of like this. Uh, what do I like? What do I like? Um, yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll go with this one. Um, so here's what a muscle fiber looks like. You can see it's very different looking, right? But you see these like big uh, little purple sections here? That's the nucleus. So, you know, it's not a ball like it was in the other cell because this one's not shaped like that. It's kind of stretched out, right? Um, so it's, it's shaped a little bit differently, but it's still a nucleus, right? It's still doing the same thing. This has got all the DNA that tells your muscle cell how to grow. Um, you see this like weird webbing, this tubing? Um, now, the, it, this is that uh, endoplasmic reticulum that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, that web, uh, that webbing that surrounds the, the, the outside of the nucleus there, that, that webbing, right? That's the endoplasmic reticulum. So that's what this webbing is right here. The only difference is because it is slightly different looking, uh, they're going to give it a muscle shaped name. They're going to rename it. It's going to go by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, what that is, the reason they called it sarco is because the root word of the word sarc, uh, sarco actually means flesh in Latin. And your muscles or your body is like the flesh of your body is mostly muscle. So whenever you hear the word sarco before something, you're probably talking about a muscle. Or whenever you hear the word myo, which actually means muscle, uh, myo or sarco, we are probably in muscle country. We're probably talking about muscles, okay? So those are sort of prefixes that I want you guys to be a little familiar with. Um, but that's the endoplasmic reticulum. It's just, they call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what that does is that actually acts as a network of tubes uh, for calcium to travel around. And we will talk about why calcium uh, is so important here in just a moment. Um, so we got nucleuses, we got nuclei, I guess is the plural. Uh, we got this sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then there's the little pill bugs, right? There's the mitochondria, which there are a ton of sort of straddling the muscle. And that makes your muscles really good at producing energy, which they freaking need to be. Um, because, uh, you know, your muscles burn a lot of energy moving your body around all day. Um, and then one thing that you can also see here, uh, is we've also got sarcoplasm and it's kind of, again, pointing to really nothing, right? And that's the cytoplasm within a muscle cell. It's the fluid in a muscle cell. So normally we call it cytoplasm, but because we're in flesh territory, we're going to say sarcoplasm. So those are some of the components I want you guys to be somewhat familiar with. So let's go back to our PowerPoint and our notes here. Um, so the sarcoplasm is the liquid portion of our muscle cells. And what's going to be found in there is this material called glycogen. Um, glycogen is basically stored carbohydrates within your body. Uh, carbs are our body's favorite way to make energy. Um, our body loves to break down carbohydrates into sugar and then use that sugar to produce energy. Um, and so we keep some of it in our muscle. It actually stores some glycogen. About 1% to 2% of your body weight is actually glycogen. Um, yeah, 2% if it's a freaking lot. Usually it's close to 1%. Uh, we got some fats in there because fats are also used to produce energy. So that, that fluid is just kind of, you know, it's kind of, it's like a little savings account, you know, or it's like a wallet, <laughs> right? Uh, 
um, you know, I, I, my mom would always keep like, she would always hide like about a hundred dollars in her purse from my dad that he wasn't supposed to know about, but we all knew about, you know, <laughs> like, and it was like, whenever, you know, she would have it squirreled away. And whenever it was like my, you know, money was tight or something, my mom would sort of tap into that. Right. Um, that's kind of what like, you know, the fats and the carbohydrates are kind of just stored in there to, to have on you. Um, you'll see some minerals in there, things like calcium, which is obviously huge, uh, but sodium and potassium are really big ones that you'll find in there. Those are acting as like electrolytes, um, which is why we drink electrolyte water, you know, that's sodium and potassium ions. Uh, and then there's this really cool material called myoglobin. And myoglobin is a, a, actually a protein uh, that is good at binding to oxygen. And that allows us to carry oxygen throughout the entire muscle cell because we need oxygen to also produce energy. That's what the mitochondria uses. Um, so the mitochondria is able to produce energy with the help of oxygen. How do we get that oxygen delivered to the mitochondria? Thanks to our myoglobin. So that is what that, you've probably heard of hemoglobin, uh, which is found in your blood cells. That carries oxygen, then the hemoglobin drops it off to the myoglobin and the myoglobin carries it to the mitochondria. So uh, those are the components, right? Those are, that's, that's what you're gonna find in the fluid of all your muscle cells. Like I said, you're gonna see some nuclei in there, right? That's the brain of your cells. Um, you're gonna find some mitochondria, which are trans, you know, transforming energy from food into energy for the cell. So taking carbohydrates and turning it into what is called ATP, uh, you know, that's energy, uh, or turning it, you know, uh, turning fat into ATP, you know, again, um, ATP is sort of our version of energy within our body. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, which is honestly the, the most important thing that we're talking about today, <laughs> uh, are you will also see all of the myofibrils. So see all these little rods right here, right? Look at all these like, you know, bundles of all these like little rods. This is an individual cell here, but you can see there's a bundling, there's another bundling. And then in that bundle are these little, what are called myofilaments. And those are little contractile proteins and they run from end to end within the muscle cell. And that way it's like, it can grab this side of the muscle cell and it can grab that side of the muscle cell and it can pull it towards the center and the muscle cell will shorten. Um, and so these contractile proteins are arguably the most important part of, you know, what we are sort of observing in muscle. This is what gives muscles their unique shape to be able to actually contract are these little rods in here, these, these myofilaments. So those myofibrils, right, is the bundle. Um, so the bundle here, that's a myofibril. And within it are the actual proteins called myofilaments. So a myofibril contains your myofilaments and the myofilaments are the actual contractile parts of the cell. So there are, and, and here's what that kind of looks like as well. This is a picture from your, your trail guide. Um, so there are three, uh, there's, there's four, but there's, there's two actual contractile ones. And then there's sort of a chaperone in the way. So this is what those myofilaments uh, look like, okay? So the myofilaments that you've got are gonna be actin, myosin, and then these other two called troponin and tropomyosin, okay? Like I said, the names today, they're not the most intuitive names. They're really technical names today. Like yesterday, it's like a oh, joint is an articulation. It's like, oh, I can understand that because I'm articulating with my teeth, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm articulating when I speak clearly, right? It's like, I can understand, like my words fit together. I can see how that fits together. It's like the words kind of make sense. Today, they're just biology words. <laughs> so, you know, get some flashcards, start getting used to these darn names because um, they do like to ask you about them. So these myofilaments that we've got are going to be actin and myosin. Actin and myosin are like, not to get too crude, but two really into each other, madly in love teenagers at like a high school dance. They want to get all up in each other's business. <laughs> That's all they want to do. They just want to bind together. And if they bind together, they're going to pull on one another. They want to grope and, you know, embrace each other. That's what this is like. 
Particularly, myosin wants to get all up in actin's business. So let's look at what these look like. Actin is this little thin strand that you can see right here. Okay, so these are actin strands. Um, and actin strands have, it's, it's the thin filament, it's the thin myofilament, and it has all these really attractive binding sites. So let's go ahead and zoom in and take a look at what that looks like, right? Because you can see there's the myofibril. Look at how, by the way, look at how small they look from zoomed out right here, right? Like this is a pretty well-drawn picture. If I zoom in like crazy, you can see how they're all just like crossing over each other. Those are those little tiny freaking strands that I mentioned. Right? So you can imagine how friggin' microscopic we're getting when we're talking about this. We didn't know this, by the way, until about the 50s. Um, that's when we were first able to actually observe these proteins. Um, but let's take a look at actin and myosin. So actin and myosin, they've got these different little strands here, right? And you can see, here's the thin strand. Okay, that's your actin strand. And notice how it's made up of all these little like circles, right? Um, those are binding sites, okay? Um, those binding sites are really attractive to that thick strand uh, that's in the middle there, right? So if you look, see this like thick strand right here? That is called your myosin. So actin is the thin filament responsible for muscle contractions. And it has these binding sites that myosin is super attracted to. Like myosin wants to get all up on actin's binding sites, okay? Um, and what myosin has, the way it's able to get, you know, sort of involved there, if you look at it, look at how it's, it looks like a, like a weird Dr. Seuss tree, right? Yeah. See how it's got all these like weird little fingers, these little like club head things? Um, kind of weird looking, right? It looks like, uh, what is that? Um, yeah, they're out here in California. I'd never seen one until I moved here. Uh, Pine oh, tree? No, it's, no. It's, it's a form of an aloe plant, I think. Aloe plant, California. <laughs> uh, oh, close. Uh, God, what are they called? Uh, they were in, they actually, when I say Dr. Seuss, I actually mean that um, he, he was inspired by them, which is why his books look the way they do. Um, uh, you find them in Joshua Tree. And you, I mean, they're all over. They're on every hike that you go to out here. Um, gosh darn it. Uh, weird California. <laughs> Weird California people. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, so close. Not quite what I'm looking for. All right, I'm gonna spend five more seconds. Four, three. I am never gonna find it. <laughs> All right, I'm giving up. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a form. I think it's like a form of aloe plant or, or something like that. Um, but it's, it's, you know, you see them on like at Runyon Canyon and stuff. And they got like, they have these like little heads. They like, they got these like little club like heads that kind of branch out and they look like that. Um, so those are actually able to reach up. They reach out and they grab the binding site. And then what they do is they pull towards the center. So, um, uh, you know, what's going to happen, um, is, you know, these guys, are basically going to pull this way. And then the proteins on the other side, they're gonna pull this way. And so then the entire thing is gonna slide like this. And that's why they're arranged the way they are. Um, now, this is gonna be arranged end to end to end to end. And you can actually see in the picture here in the PowerPoint, notice how the next, there's like a little line right here. And then the next one's starting and it's straddling like this actin strand here and this actin is between these actin strands here uh, and they straddle each other. And if you, if you were to draw like a line from here to here to here to here like that, it looks, you would make like a Z, right? So we call that like a Z line. So, whoops, God dang it. Um, 
ah, there we go. So that Z action right there is, is the area between uh, where this contraction is taking place. And so this one's going to pull this way, this one's going to pull this way, and the whole thing is going to shorten. And it'll look something kind of like this. Um, is that not actually the GIF version? Oh, there it is. So it'll look something kind of like this. this. This should animate here in just a second. Or not. Uh, there we go. So see how it's crawling towards the center? The, the actin strands are being pulled together because myosin's reaching up and grabbing it and pulling it towards the center. And so that's happening in this whole area right here. See the little heads reaching up and kind of grabbing, right? So that's what's happening. Now, Going back to our high school dance analogy, uh, what are all the teachers doing at this high school dance while these teens are trying to get at one another? It's they're separating. There. Yeah, <laughs> they're like six inches, you know, <laughs> like yeah, pull apart, right? That is where uh, we call those in, in our work, we're going to call those regulatory proteins. <laughs> they are regulating how the contractions are taking place. Um, those live on the actin strand and they are called troponin and tropomyosin. Okay. These are also myofilaments, but they're not contractile myofilaments. In fact, they're the exact opposite. They are chaperones that are there to stop contractions from happening when they're not supposed to. So troponin and tropomyosin live on the actin strand and they block myosin's heads from being able to reach up and grab the actin. Okay. And so uh, you can't see that in this version, but if we look at like um, the way troponin and tropomyosin work is you can actually see it's kind of a strand here, right? And that's blocking the binding sites. But if those binding sites move out of the way, there it is, right? Like right now it's all blocked, but if it gets out of the way, myosin is able to reach up. It's the green stuff here. It's able to reach up and grab actin. So, but we got to get it out of the way in order for that to happen. So how the heck do we move those strands out of the way? How do we get that strand to sort of uncurl and expose those binding sites? Well, remember earlier I mentioned calcium is actually going to be very important for muscle contractions. Uh, if we were to flush calcium into the fluid of your muscle cells, troponin and tropomyosin are super attracted to calcium. So what they do is that calcium lifts the troponin and tropomyosin away and the binding sites are exposed and myosin's like, all right, I'm getting in there. And it reaches up and it grabs the actin and it pulls it towards the center. Uh, and that is what happens in every single muscle contraction you've ever made. That's happening in every one of your muscle cells every time they contract. So again, this is what that kind of looks like, right? Here's a different, this is what it looks like in your, in the trail guide to movement book. So you can see the thick filament, right? It's got all the heads on it. That's the myosin. And then the thin filament here, which is all the binding sites, that's the actin. And you will notice it creates this kind of Z here. This actin strand is offset compared to this one, which is offset compared to that one. It creates the zigzagging motion. And so what'll happen is this area right here will contract. Meanwhile, the one that's over here, which you, they're not drawing the full one, but it's like that one's going to contract and the one over here is going to contract. And so in a relaxed muscle, none of the, you know, the, the, the troponin and tropomyosin, in a relaxed muscle, they are in place blocking the binding sites. The muscle is not contracting. Then the nervous system says, hey, I want to contract that muscle, right? I want that muscle to squeeze so that I can lift the, these groceries, right? Uh, so how does it actually do that? How does your nervous system get this to happen? Well, it zaps the muscle with a little bit of electricity and that little bit of electricity runs across the muscle cell and that triggers the release of stored calcium. Calcium floods in, the chaperones move out of the way and the contraction takes place. So, uh, then you can see here's a partially contracted and there's like a fully contracted muscle. And you can see, notice how like there's actually sort of like, oh, let's see if I can zoom in here. Yeah. You see how like 
this actin strand is kind of crossing over this actin strand, right? Like they're kind of, they've, they've kind of slid past one another. This is why everything that I'm describing today has a name. Uh, this process of like binding and unbinding, we call it the sliding filament model. And it's because the myofilaments are literally sliding across one another like this. And that is what that bunching sensation is in our muscles, right? You can see they are bunching up because, you know, this is pretty thin, right? And then if I slide them across each other, it's much thicker, just like our muscles, right? Um, so uh, now the area where all this is occurring, by the way, also has a name. Um, the space between these two Z lines right here, uh, that area is called the sarcomere. So the space between this Z-line and this Z-line, we call it the sarcomere. Um, that is where the contractions are taking place. So you'll sometimes hear, you know, er, uh, on day one, I mentioned how the neuron is the functional unit of the nervous system. And it's because your nervous system is able to do what it does because of neurons. Well, the sarcomere, from our perspective as like personal trainers, right, who are all about contracting muscles, the sarcomere is the functional unit of the muscular system. Because without sarcomeres being able to like do this sliding filament action, uh, we wouldn't be able to actually contract our muscle cells, which means that our body wouldn't move around. So we have to understand, like we have to have a pretty good understanding of this. And if I'm describing this right now, you're probably starting to kind of picture like, oh, okay, I got a pretty good idea of like what it would look like with all these like proteins. So how do you make a person stronger? make more proteins, right? Like make more of these little myofilaments. The more of them that you have, the stronger a muscle fiber is gonna be, right? Um, or maybe make, uh, make some more fluid, you know, make a big squishier, more fluid cell. Because what does that mean? It means you can store more calcium, which means you can flush more calcium, which means more myofilaments are gonna have an easier time, right? Start to see the connection between like the, the cell part of it and the going into the gym, lifting weights part of it, right? We teach our body like, hey, I'm gonna contract over and over and over again, and I'm gonna create all the cellular damage, right? My body's gonna make lactic acid as a byproduct, that acid's gonna burn these fibers, I'm gonna beat up my actin and my myosin, both of them are gonna get damaged, right? And my immune system is gonna come along and be like, you, you broke all my proteins, right? Like you, you tore them all up, you damaged them. And so it's gonna build them up. But rat, again, just like the bones we were talking about yesterday, rather than building them back to where they were, it's gonna build them back just a little bit stronger. So you did 15 push-ups, collapsed on the ground, worked really, really hard, right? Go get some dinner, go to bed, wake up two days later, you go do 16 push-ups. And then your mm -hmm. body's like, come on, man, we just fixed this, right? <laughs> and then you eat again, you go to bed, right? Repeat, 17 push-ups. And your body's like, <laughs> and it's just it's got to keep up right uh and that's how muscle growth really works it makes more and more it's like your body is like look if you're gonna keep doing this i'm gonna make i'm gonna make more proteins right and you're like yeah that's that's what i want to have happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's getting me to the beach you know <laughs> um so how do we feel about all that you guys got any questions on uh on the sliding filament action um no. All right. Nope. You're clear. Oh, I got one question. Yeah. So up? to make like if I was to just drink like way more water mm -hmm. and then just like eat my normal diet, that would make me stronger, huh? Because the cells are absorbing more water, they're getting bigger. So a little they, bit. You would little. actually kind of need to have a reason to drive that water into the cells. Yeah. Um, but yes, you're, you're not wrong. Would it actually make you stronger? Uh, you know, maybe, right. Like, yeah. um, you know, it, it, you know, without like a, a training stimulus, your body really has no reason to increase its strength. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, but, but in order to like drive that water into your muscles, you need to kind of have a reason to draw it in there and you're yeah. not going to draw it in there without lifting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I drink um, a ton of water. <laughs> yeah, right. That's actually why. Uh, so creatine, right? Yeah. Creatine is a really popular supplement. Yeah, uh, it absorbs more water, right? It holds more water in the cell. 
Yep, exactly. Okay. So it drives, it's a very, it's a, oh, what's the term? Uh, it's a, uh, it's an osmotic material, which means it, it attracts water. Okay. Um, which is why, like, if you're on creatine, you got to make sure you're drinking tons and tons and tons of water in order yeah. to get the most out of it, you know? And by the way, creatine is one of the few supplements that you will hear me say, I'm pro, I, I like creatine. I think it's, I think it's, yeah. Um, yeah. I am very much pro creatine. Uh, what, uh, what does monohydrate mean? Like exactly? Oh, it just means that it's singularly, um, so it's Con been uh, dehydrated in such a way that it's all by itself. All right. Okay. It's it's the it's creatine separated from anything else. Yeah, yeah. So that's what okay. they call it because there's some like uh, supplements that have a lot of mixture of different things all at once. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So honestly, the one I like, guys, uh, I don't want to be an advertisement here, but the one that I get is um, uh, bulksupplements.com. Um, so you can just go to this website here and uh yeah they make whey protein they make all this stuff and their creatine is great i've had a great time with it it's super freaking cheap uh yeah, i use the same one all by itself well oh. you know can i be honest with y'all i've never taken creatine no never no. uh just coffee that's my only pre-workout <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Or you sometimes like, like, let's say right now, like I had a coffee earlier, so it warns off after a while. So then like maybe, well, because we, we've been getting out early and I still have like a little bit of energy left, but yeah. like, let's say if we were to get out of class, like at one or something like that, then yeah, I'll definitely have to drink like a celly mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. 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 But like, I, uh... so would, would you recommend somebody like me who doesn't take it to take it? I mean, I've never taken it. It's I've been into training for like two years, like mm -hmm. serious it's training, like for two years. I see how you feel yeah yeah so what are, the, what are the benefits for that basically so here's the other part of it um we're not talking about this today we'll talk about this actually in a couple mods um but one of the other things is like you've got different energy systems um that allow you to produce energy right so earlier i was talking about the mitochondria mm -hmm. mitochondria is where you produce we call it aerobic energy um which is like low intensity long duration energy so you think about like your muscles that are you're using when you go like run like a marathon, right? Um, that's very much like aerobic energy, right? Um, anything greater than two minutes is aerobic. Um, so you're producing energy in the mitochondria, which means you need to have plenty of oxygen, uh, but you also need carbohydrates in the background because carbohydrates are going to slowly fuel, you know, they're going to get turned into lactic acid, which is going to fuel the mitochondria. Um, so what about the, so that's one fuel source, right? Working our way backwards from there, what about like under two minutes in length, right? Like I said, that's anything greater than two minutes. Um, what about under two minutes? Well, if you're somewhere around like 30 seconds up to, yeah, about two minutes, you're gonna be using what's called glycolysis. And basically sugar, carbohydrates, are gonna get broken down into uh, ATP. And then lactic acid is going to be also produced as a byproduct. So you're going to make energy and you're going to make some lactic acid. Um, and both that's going to get released into the cell. That's your high intensity energy. Well, think of it as like medium to high intensity energy, right? Um, and that's where, you know, like lifting, like six to 12 reps, right? Um, or 15 reps if you're moving, you know, quickly, like speedily, right? Um, but, you know, it's the, the 30 seconds, right? Um, but what about like lifting super, 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 super heavy, and you can only do maybe five repetitions because that's how heavy you're lifting, right? If you can do six repetitions, you're starting to get into glycolysis. What about before that? Well, before that, your body is relying on uh, creatine to produce energy because your body naturally produces creatine. So we call that your phosphagen system. Um, because it's the, the chemical name for creatine is creatine phosphate. Um, and so uh, that lasts about 10 seconds, very short duration, right? So you asked, should you take creatine? I would say if you are lifting in such a way that your sets are less than 10 seconds long, so say you're doing super high intensity, one, two, three, I'm done right? Like, like really high intensity. That is where you'll get the biggest benefits from creatine. 
Because my yeah. short times are really short too in between sets. So I'll it's two percent my stuff. Let's let's say I'll do like a weighted pull up. Yeah. Then immediately I go straight into a deadlift. And okay. then the rest times, like obviously because it's really heavy, I'll take maybe about a minute and a half, maybe something like that. Yeah. And then come right at it. But let's say I, I did shoulders yesterday. So I went like back to back. Like it was because I was in a rush, so I had to finish quick. So then I did um what is it, the dumbbell shoulder press. And then I superset that with two different ones. I would do the lateral raise and then the front raise. And then I'll go straight into ab work, like literally right after. And then do like three different uh, ab exercises and then rest for like 45 seconds and then do that like two more times. So if you're speeding through things like that, look at how it's not always, but it's just sometimes like, you know what I mean? Sure. Well, how you got to ask yourself, how long are you under tension? You know, because it's yeah. like you're not really done. Like how many let's say you did even if it only was, let's say eight reps, right? I, I did 12 for each. Okay. So if you're as high as 12, you're definitely getting into glycolysis, maybe even aerobic. Um, by that point, creatine's not really going to help you Okay. because it only lasts about 10 seconds. Gotcha. Right. Before, before like it disperses and then needs to come back, right? And then it needs to use the other energy systems. Yeah. So you'd be much better off relying on like a good carb heavy meal before you get to the gym. Mm -hmm. um, that would help. Um, and creatine will help for your first 10 seconds, but because you're going beyond that, uh, you you, you would get some benefits. Like, don't get me wrong. Like it, there'd be some benefit. Um, but like, is it worth the money that you'd spend? I don't know. You know, that's, that's probably yeah. you in your lifestyle, you know? Um, but if it were me, I would, I, I, I only use creatine in months like this. I only use creatine when I'm lifting super, super, super heavy next month when the weights are gonna go a little bit lighter and my reps are gonna go a little higher, I'll come off it because I could get some benefit from it, but I just don't wanna spend the money, you know? Yeah, I feel you. I see, I see, I see what you mean. Um, and then it would drive some water into your muscles um, and there's some benefit there. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a personal choice. Like it's, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, and the same thing is true about like pre-workout. Some people swear by it. Uh, me, I like coffee you know um but like if i'm in a hurry and i want to hit my bloodstream a little faster yeah pre-workouts quick you know yeah um, so I'll, I'll go pick one up at like a you know gas station or something if i know i need something like that if i need like a pick me up but that's one um so caffeine um creatine and then the other supplement that i say that i will say is effective uh is just your classic whey protein Mm -hmm. um, just because whey protein is very digestible protein. Uh, it's just already been broken down in such a way that your body's like, that's perfect. Put it in the bloodstream. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's other supplements out there for sure. But those are the three that I, if I'm going to spend money, that's it. Those are the only three. Yeah. Really be willing to spend on. That's pretty much what I got. I got a pre-workout. I got just regular glutamine by itself and the whey protein, mm -hmm. but the whey protein, I can't take it all the time. It'll, it'll mess me up. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. but it's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's some really good vegan proteins out there too. If that, if that yeah, plant-based. Everybody's telling me to try those. Yeah. But the main thing I don't like about it is how it tastes, bro. It's so nasty sometimes. Like, yeah. You got to find know? the right one sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. like a coconut one or something. <laughs> have you tried uh, their uh, ghost products? I mean, their flavor is good and they have vegan options too. Okay, yeah, I'll check ghost. ghost. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty pricey though. I think, I mean, but they have a good amount of servings though. So like 26, yeah. 28, I think. So that's pretty good enough. Okay. And then for me, like I always take um, BC Dole's every time during my workouts. That, yeah. That's really yeah. good. I need to start that, I guess, too. Yeah, that can be fine. I mean, if you're getting enough protein in your diet, um, so you know, uh, if you've got plenty of protein and you're timing your protein well, you don't necessarily need BCAAs, but they can be a really good supplement. If you're like, if you're one of those people that sometimes like your schedule just gets away from you and you're like, God, I don't have time to eat. Like BCAAs are a really great way to like supplement that in and kind of fill in your gaps, you know? Okay. Um, so I love, you know, they're really, really handy for that. Or, or if you're like intermittent fasting, um, yeah. BCAAs are, are a, a good option. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, we kind of got into it a little bit, but that's all the stuff that's happening within the cell. Now, how do we actually trigger all of this to happen, right? We got the nervous system. This is where the ner nervous system and the muscular system are going to kind of work together, right? So you're going to have what is called neural activation. 
Neural activation is the contraction of a muscle uh, thanks, to a, thanks to neural stimulation. So if we look at, there's actually a connection, here's our muscle fiber, right? Um, if we look at like a, what's called a motor unit, okay? A motor unit is where you'll have a motor neuron. Remember those are the ones that are coming from the brain going to a muscle or an organ or something like that. And you will have all of the individual muscle cells that that one neuron is attached to. So the neuron has all these little fingers that branch off from it. Here's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, muscle cells that this neuron is attached to. So it is working as a sort of a unit, right? Uh, it honestly, I, I always kind of think of like the military. It's like, it's like you got, you know, a uh, superior officer of some type and he's got all of his troops underneath him, right? That's kind of what a motor unit is, right? That superior officer is a kind of an example of like the neuron and, and the, the muscle fibers themselves or, you know, all the troops. Um, so uh, I can close this now actually. Um, so looking at that neural activation, right? A motor unit is a, a single motor neuron and all of the individual muscle cells, muscle fibers, that it zaps, that it, we, we call that innervates, right? That it, it sort of stimulates. Um, so what happens is motor neurons are attached to muscle fibers. And when that neuron contracts, um, it will innervate all of the muscle fibers it's attached to, to fully contract. So that what will happen, um, let's see here. Uh, I wonder if I can get motor unit. I wonder if I can find a GIF of this actually happening. There we go. Yeah. So an electric signal will travel down and it will zap all those fibers simultaneously. And you can see, <laughs> right? A little contraction there. <laughs> um, so that is sort of the, the mind muscle connection that we're seeing here, right? Now, here's the thing. I said that it uses like electrochemical signals, right? So the chemical that your neurons are actually using is what's called acetylcholine or ACH. And that's what's called a neurotransmitter, okay? So a neurotransmitter is this chemical that when it binds to certain uh, binding sites, triggers these reactions to happen. So this is the neurotransmitter that's responsible for muscle contractions. So when you think about like, dopamine if you've heard of that you know that's the you know you do something that makes you happy like uh you know when you're you ball up a curl you know curl up like a, a ball of paper and you shoot it into the trash can and you make it in and you're like kobe you know <laughs> like you feel really good for a second that's dopamine you know <laughs> like, you're like ah, i'm awesome you know um a little bit of dopamine or like awesome. serotonin you know yeah. That's another one. It makes you feel really happy. It's like the, the, the pleasant sensation of, so that's what makes you hit the snooze button, you know, um, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. That's what, that's one that helps us form connections with other humans. Uh, they call it the cuddle hormone actually. Um, and it's because like oxytocin is something that, you know, makes you sort of fall in love with other people, you know? Um, so lots of neurotransmitters out there. This neurotransmitter, uh, is the one that zaps our muscles. So acetylcholine, what will happen is, uh, and you can see here's the whole process right here. And I know this is like a wall of text, um, but this is literally describing from start to finish how muscle contractions take place. So what will happen is when the nervous system wants to interact with the muscular system, it will release acetylcholine into the muscle and that will bind to these specific binding sites and acetylcholine is what triggers the release of all that stored up calcium into the sarcomere, into the sarcoplasm, right? Uh, and that causes, once there's calcium in there, that causes the regulatory proteins, that's troponin and tropomyosin, uh, to move away to bind to the calcium. That way it exposes the binding sites. And now actin's binding sites are exposed, which allows myosin to bind and grab uh, that binding site. And so then we will see the sliding happen in what is called the sliding filament theory or the sliding filament model, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and that will actually occur. And so you can see this sarcomere here is gonna shorten and there's just gonna be less space you know, from end to end here. Um, 
So here's the thing about this, right? And that's, that's what we call, we call that excitation contraction coupling. You are exciting a muscle and so a contraction is happening. The fibers are coupling together, right? So again, electricity travels. Uh, you can see that in this GIF right here, right? Electricity is traveling down a neuron and it gets to the muscle fiber. And it uses this chemical, acetylcholine, to uh, cause electricity to run throughout the entire muscle fiber. And while it's doing that, whenever that electricity is running across, it causes all the calcium to get flushed into the area. So now calcium moves in, the binding sites open up, they kind of lift away and expose uh, actin's binding sites, right? Troponin and tropomyosin, they move away. Actin's binding sites are exposed and myosin's like, oh my God. And it gets up there and grabs and pulls it, right? And that creates the sliding action. And then once that contraction's over, remember earlier I mentioned ATP, um, it will actually bind back to uh, myosin's little head uh, and that causes it to release and that flushes all the calcium out of the area so that the next contraction can occur later. Uh, the binding sites go back, or the, uh, the chaperones go back to blocking the binding sites and myosin goes back into a resting position with that ATP molecule, which is why it has so much pent up energy and wants to bind again later. Um, this is actually why, uh, you ever hear about like rigor mortis? Um, you know, that's like, you see that in dead bodies. <laughs> um, that's why they call a dead body a stiff. Yeah, they, stiff. they call them a stiff because like, they get like stuck in these positions because their muscles contract and then because there's no ATP production, there's no energy production in like a dead, in dead tissue, yeah. uh, the binding sites are just exposed. So the muscles are contracted and nothing's causing them to relax to back to. Yeah. Okay. But you mean, hear somebody call somebody a working stiff. They mean that they're, they're, they're a dead man walking. <laughs> 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 um, so, oh, and, and here's, here's where that's happening, by the way. This is excitation contraction coupling, right? So you can see um, these strands here, right? And then um, act, myosin will reach up and grab the binding sites and it'll pull, uh, it'll pull. This, this picture is so weird, but it's starting here. Going weird. Yeah, it's like one, two, three, four, instead of one, two, three, four. But yeah, that is weird. <laughs> yeah, it's in a wheel. Um, I don't know why they did this, but uh, you can tell the trail guide is like artists trying to teach physiology. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it'll pull this way and then it will relax and the whole process will repeat. And basically it's just going to kind of crawl and, you know, it'll kind of move like this and yeah. then the whole thing will just kind of... Seaweed and water, that's crazy. What's that? Like it's like seaweed and water. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can see that. Um, now, one thing we got to remember about muscle cells is when a muscle cell contracts and when it, when it fires, uh, it can only fire for 100% of its effort. It cannot fire partially. Mm -hmm. It has to always contract as hard as it can. Now that seems like it doesn't make sense because you're like, well, wait a minute. Like, wouldn't that mean that every time I go to lift like a pencil off the ground, I'm like, Hur! right? Like, if all my cells fire as hard as I can, wouldn't I be lifting as hard as I can every time I try to do something? And that would be true. But one of the ways that we are able to regulate the strength of our contractions is we just don't recruit all of our muscle fibers. We recruit yeah. maybe half of them or less than half of them, right? Um, but one thing to remember is that it's called the all or nothing principle. And it says, regardless of the number of muscle fibers, when a motor unit contracts, it will always contract fully or not at all. So neurons and motor units can only contract for their full amount of strength. So the difference between a strong contraction and a weak contraction is the number of neurons and the number of muscle fibers that it is using to create this contraction. So uh, we're seeing in this picture here, this is one motor unit. That's one neuron and it's contracting one, two, three, four muscle fibers, right? But what if you were to use 50 neurons, which would contract 200 muscle fibers? Yeah. That would be a very different contraction. And that's why 
your nervous system really dictates how much strength you use. Um, and you'll see this sometimes in powerlifting. Uh, powerlifting, um, uh, nervous system fatigue. You'll see this sometimes um, in powerlifters who are absolutely just totally fried out when it comes to their nervous system. Let's see. Uh, nervous system. Uh, oh man, there's all these like examples of like how to avoid this stuff. Oh, Eddie. Yeah, Eddie, you can see. Yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, you know what? Yeah, no, we'll do that. We'll do Eddie Hall's uh, uh, his deadlift. He uh, when he, he passed so out when he was dehydrated. Yeah, or something like he that. Like, <laughs> he's oh, always, that dude's always talking about how he's dehydrated. Yeah, it's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> but you can see here, right? All the shaking and stuff. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's going he's gonna to be done. He got it and he'll drop it. And then he's like, <laughs> like and that's basically his entire nervous system is just like. <laughs> that's how I felt this Tuesday when I was deadlifting. Um, it wasn't even that heavy, though. It, it was like 265, but <laughs> I didn't have enough that. sleep that day, though. And that's Ooh. what ruined it for me because I did you. feel it. Yeah, it gets to me, especially if you're doing it like consistently, like with like not yeah. getting enough sleep, it'll for mess sure. you up bad. When I weighed 150 like a couple years ago before I hurt my back, I was doing four or five like like nothing, and I only weighed 150, bro. And I was doing that's it every good. three days. Yeah, but now yeah. I I don't go more than like two plates and like a quarter, dude, because I don't want to. I want to walk away from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll get yeah, there. I think my head my heaviest was like 345 at 138 pounds. That's cool. Yeah, that's, that was last year. Yeah. That's a lot. That's like one big guy, bro. You pick him yeah. up off the <laughs> <laughs> carry yeah. him out the doors, you know? <laughs> Jeez. That's true. Yeah. I should be uh I should be hired as a as a security guard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta the go. Clubs. They won't even expect you, dude, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damn, this little man's strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um so yeah, so that's that's what's determining our strength, you know. Like sometimes your nervous system will use lots of motor units, and you know, and you can see here, like the muscles that move, like your eyes, for instance, you use like maybe ten to twenty muscle uh, motor units, but your glutes, or actually your gastric nemus, which is way smaller, than you, uses between two and three thousand. So oh. you know, big yeah, difference. Okay, wow, that's what they're meant for, though. They're meant to, you know, be strong. Yeah, How do you, exactly. Do you call it all the time? Function so, follows. Form. Yeah, function follows form. It's my favorite yeah. thing. Yeah, so, uh, pages 92 through 102, you can see some great pictures in the trail guide. Uh, and then we are in pages 39 through 43 of the, uh, the sort of regular NASA. Um, all right, so let's talk about like uh, some of the visual characteristics. Um, you know, again, let's look at some of the form of some of these muscle fibers and talk about how uh, they might look a little bit different from one another. So you do have two major categories of muscle fibers, and they are going to look very, very different from one another. Um, so muscle fiber types, you know, your muscles will vary in terms of their chemical and then just like mechanical, like physical makeup, um, and which will give them different characteristics. So we've got type one and type two muscle fibers. Type one muscle fibers are what we call slow twitch muscle fibers. When you look at their physical characteristics, sometimes we refer to these as red fibers and we call them red fibers because they get a lot of blood flow, okay? They have more blood vessels running throughout them than your type two muscle fibers do. Um, but because of that blood flow, what does that mean? That means they're getting a lot of oxygen delivered, which means their primary fuel is oxygen based, right? Um, and remember earlier we mentioned like oxygen based means like aerobic. That's like anything that can lift for, let's say two minutes or longer, right? That's slow, long duration endurance type lifting. So they are smaller in size because they don't need to grow. They're very good at producing energy consistently. And they are used for long-term endurance type contraction. These are the muscles that are often associated with like stabilization and postural control. The muscles that are keeping you upright right now 
um, you don't really feel like you're contracting that many, those are very much slow twitch muscle fibers, right? Or if you were on a run, that's very much a slow twitch muscle fiber. The opposite of that, uh, or sort of the counter to that, are your type two muscle fibers. These are your fast twitch fibers, right? Sometimes we refer to these as white fibers because they don't get as much blood flow. Um, they are much, much, much larger in size because instead of relying on constant oxygen delivery, they rely on having more cellular fluid, more water, that's sarcoplasm, uh, mm -hmm. within the muscles, which make them really good at producing energy in that section. Now, that energy is different, though. Remember, like, you know, the aerobic system creates a little bit of ATP uh, and some carbon dioxide, which your, you know, um, which your uh, 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 respiratory system just gets rid of, right? Um, the glycolysis section, the fluid ATP production creates energy, creates ATP, but then it creates lactic acid as a byproduct. Um, so these are the muscles that are going to build up lactic acid, which, you know, that's going to further damage those proteins, which is going to further make more proteins. That's why they're so large in size. Um, they are used for short-term powerful contraction. So these are often associated with, you know, uh, you know, lifting weights, like being in the gym, right? If you're doing about 12 repetitions, you know, you're probably under tension for maybe 30 to 45 seconds, right? That's right around glycolysis. Um, you know, if you were going for a run, you'd be under tension for, you know, five, 10, 20 minutes, you know? Um, that's very much associated with your aerobic metabolism. Now, within that fast twitch, we're gonna further divide this down into two subcategories. You're gonna have your type two X fibers, <clears throat> and you're going to, which are your true fast, fast twitch. Think X, think extreme. Sometimes, by the way, this is, they'll be two, two B, um, two B fibers. It depends on who you ask, but NASM says X. And so we'll say X. Uh, and then you'll have your type two A fibers. So type two X fibers have a very low oxidative capacity. Therefore they get tired really fast, but they are the true super fast twitch. Like, you know, I'm going to see how much I can max out on a deadlift. Ugh, one, done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's a type two X fiber. Or if you're watching the NFL and it's like, wham, you hit a guy really hard and then the play's over, you know, that's type two X. It's the super explosive Usain Bolt, right? hundred meter dash type two X. Um, super explosive, does not recover very quickly, needs lots of recovery. Um, that's 2X. Then you got type 2A, which is has a higher oxidative capacity and therefore it fatigues a little bit much uh, like slower than type 2X, but it still fatigues faster than type 1. So this is kind of like a halfway between type 2 and type 1 fiber, right? Um, these are actually, when you think of like athletics, when you think of like sports, generally we're talking about type 2a fibers you know like we want athletes to have a little bit of endurance but we also want them to be peak explosive humans right um basketball players are my favorite example of this it's like they can clearly jog up and down the court but if you look they're very muscular they're you know um they still have like you know you gotta be able to get up and dunk a freaking basketball which takes a lot of force production um but that's what I think of when I think that that's very much like a type 2A situation or even like soccer players. Soccer is very aerobic, but at the same time, when they do those big explosives, they're recruiting their type 2A fibers um, where they are being, you know, still relatively strong, very relatively explosive. A soccer, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm sure LeBron can bench press more than I can, you know, um, but he is nothing in comparison to like a power lifter who is, you know, literally like full, you know, they're dedicated to type two X lifting or an Olympic weightlifter, you know, uh, yeah. not saying they're not strong, just saying those are very different types of type two fibers. Um, and then none of them are going to be able to run as long as like a marathoner, who's very much like a type one fiber person, you know? Um, so those are sort of the different types of fibers and those are different types of lifting, you know? Uh, you got to ask your clients like, hey, what do you want to be good at? What do you want to work on? You know, um, so when we look at these defining characteristics, you can kind of see they literally look and act different. Type one, 
more capillaries, more mitochondria, more myoglobin, all the things that produce aerobic energy. Whereas type two, less capillaries, less mitochondria, less myoglobin, not very good at aerobic metabolism. Um, type one, increased oxygen delivery. Type two, decreased oxygen delivery. Type one, because there's so much oxygen, lactic acid doesn't really sit around that long. Instead, it gets burned up for energy really quickly. Um, uh, so that is, uh, they're going to be smaller in size because they don't have as much lactic acid. Whereas type two fibers, they build up a lot of lactic acid, which damages the proteins, which makes more protein. So they are larger in size. Um, being larger in size, they can produce more force. Type one, they produce less force. Uh, but type one, very slow to fatigue. Type two, very fast to fatigue, <laughs> right? So we're kind of going back and forth opposites here. Um, type one is used for long-term stabilization contractions. Uh, type two is used for short-term explosive contractions. And so that is what makes type one slow twitch and type two fast twitch. Um, all right, so any questions on that before we move into our final topic today? Um, I guess I got one. So if I want to work on both, right? Like doing a burnout would be the way to do it. No? Yeah. Burnouts will get you at the end. Uh, that's very much going to kind of get you into the aerobic okay. side of things. That's where yeah. like workout finishers are kind of getting really popular. I, mean, I was just reading about that yeah. yesterday. Cause I do that um, almost everything and it doesn't really make me too tired. Like, yeah. You know? Um, so that's the thing, like you want to lift relatively heavy to get the type two stuff activated. Uh, yeah. And then you can sort of finish it off with like some explosive sort of aerobic stuff um, by uh, kind of getting into, Reverse. you know, the, the aerobic stuff at the end. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. What if I, okay, what if like, okay, let's say I'm doing bench press, right? Or, mm -hmm. or let's say I'm, yeah, okay, I'm doing bench press. So I'll start with like a five on each side, right? <laughs> and I'll do it 10 times and then right away I'll throw some some 45s on it and then try to do it a couple times instead of doing it the opposite way. So that's called a reverse pyramid. Um, yeah. That has some benefits, but the problem mm. is if you're not taking rest uh, between the, between like the push set, weights. Yeah. If you're yeah. just trying to get heavier and heavier, that you're kind of working, you're not playing to the strengths, you're playing yeah. to the weakness. Okay. Which sometimes right. feels really great because it's like yeah. you're building mental toughness and stuff, but it's not the best way to build muscle. Yeah, or yeah. Build strength. Okay, yeah. Um, I would flip it around if you're yeah. trying to go for a burnout. Yeah, for a burnout, yeah, that's usually what I do. I'll just put like a 45 and then, you know, if I could do 225 like 10 times, I would do that and take off one plate. Yep. Yeah, now, yeah. That being said, if you do want to try to like build strength and you want to try to trick your nervous system into getting stronger and stronger, take yeah. plenty of rest in between the increases and go up okay. that reverse pyramid. Reverse yeah. pyramids are a great way to build strength if you're taking an adequate rest. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So, like sometimes I'm going to try that today. Put all the weights on my rack. And <laughs> 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 you know? yeah, sometimes what I would do, like, um, usually I superset my workouts, but let's say if I want to focus like on a uh, barbell squat right like i want to work on my numbers then i'll just do a single set for that and um usually what i would do is i'll have like three sets and i'll like ha i'll start with 12 reps with whatever weight i feel comfortable with and wow. then i'll like increase the increments of you know pounds or whatever my second set and then i'll lower yeah. my reps by two so i'll be like 10 reps then like my final set will be like my heaviest whatever i can do work yeah. if i need work on them that i'll stick to that weight but let's say if i do a set then i'll move up next week and be like all right cool for eight reps i did uh, i don't know let's say 220 25 or something like that right then after that i burn out doing uh drop set so i'll drop all the way up about six to a 45 and it just ripped by like 10 reps and jesus christ <laughs> that's that's crazy yeah but that's usually like i'm working towards like strength and also at the same time like you know what i mean yeah yeah bring the muscle down yeah it's hard <laughs> yeah um all right, well, let's take a look here. Uh, like I said, kinesiology, right? We're gonna wrap everything up today with our most important concept, uh, which is talking about like how our muscles are arranged to actually move us around. So here's what's one thing to remember about muscles. And I don't have this in your notes or anything, but here's a principle to remember. Muscles can only pull. 
It's all they can do. Muscles can shorten and they can relax back to their original length. Muscles cannot push in the opposite direction. Now, I know that seems confusing considering that we have so many exercises called like the push press and the push up and things like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the muscles themselves, the muscles are pulling. Your pectoralis major is pulling your arm yeah. this way. That's what's raising you away from the ground. Even though it's called a push up, the yeah. muscles pulling, right? Pulling. Yeah. Um, so if that's the case, if I want to pull myself this way, how do I get back this way? I need to pull that way, right? So, or if I want to bend my arm, I pull with this, this has to relax. But if I want to go the other way, this will pull, and then this has to relax, right? Yeah. Now this is pulling and this is relaxing. So that is how muscles are arranged throughout your entire body. Every muscle you've got has an opposite muscle on the other side of the joint. Uh, and that's kinesiology. Right now we're, we're kind of pivoting, right? We're getting into the kinesis stuff. Um, so we have to have a good way to label all this stuff in order for us to not get confused when we're describing which muscle does which thing. So um, muscles are doing all kinds of different things. Um, but, uh, and, and one thing you need to remember is that, you know, uh, a muscle is gonna be the main muscle that we're describing to like create an action one moment and it's gonna be the exact opposite muscle one another moment. So every muscle in your body can be like the main character in one story and then a side muscle that's sort of just there to help stabilize the area in the next version of things, right? So keep in mind uh, that in the course of one simple action, a muscle's role can actually change. It can start the move, movement, typo. Uh, it can start the movement as an agonist, so the main muscle, and then quickly switch hats to become like a fixator and just hold that muscle in place. And then it can finish as like a synergist where like another muscle is taking over and then suddenly it's just helping, you know? Um, so first one we're going to talk about is what's when a muscle is what is called an agonist, okay? Uh, an agonist is when the muscle is acting as the primary mover of a joint action, it's the prime mover for a movement. So when you think of a squat, the prime mover is the gluteus, Maximus. That's the agonist. The main muscle that's like doing, you know, hip extension, which is what squatting is, right? Uh, you are extending your hip away, driving your legs away, driving your butt away from the ground. Um, that is when the gluteus maximus is the agonist. Now you might be thinking, it's like, well, what about the quads? Yeah, quads are there. They're helping, right? They're very much assisting. Uh, or what about the hamstrings? Yeah, they're very much helping, you know? Uh, but the main muscle is the agonist. So the prime mover is the agonist. Think of it this way, guys. The, my favorite analogy to use, this is Batman. Batman's the main character of Detective Comics, right? He's the main character of Batman. Right, the protagonist? He's the protagonist, exactly. Okay. Yep, okay. the agonist. Yep, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so then you've got synergists, right? Synergists are muscles that are assisting prime movers. So for hip extension, right? Your gluteus maximus is doing hip extension, right? That's the main muscle. Well, my hamstrings also do a little bit of hip extension. They're not as good at it as the glutes are, but they are there to help so that the glute doesn't have to do too much work. So their job is to, a synergist is to work in synergy with the prime mover and assist that prime mover. So your hamstrings are a synergist during hip extension. So think about doing a deadlift. The main muscle is the glute. The hamstrings are there to help, unless it's a Romanian deadlift, in which case now you're doing a lot of hamstring work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's you know an assister muscle. So think of this as like Robin, right? Robin is Batman's sidekick. He's there to help, but like we don't want him doing too much work, right? He's taking on the thugs while Batman's fighting, you know, uh, the penguin or whatever, right? He's there to help, but he's not there to do all the work. Um, then you've got antagonists. Antagonists are the opposite direction. So my biceps opposite is my triceps. My hamstrings opposite is my quadriceps. My glutes opposite is my hip flexors, right? These muscles that drive my hip this way. So the glute goes this way, my hip flexors go this way, right? They are opposites of one another, right? Uh, my right trapezius goes like this. My left trapezius goes like this. They are antagonists to one another, right? Um, 
So they work opposite of the prime movers. The hip flexors are the antagonists during hip extension in this example. It's like the Joker, right? The Joker is the complete opposite of Batman. Batman's mm -hmm. all about order. Jo Joker's all about chaos, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we got stabilizers and stabilizer muscles are there to kind of support the body. Um, sometimes you use stabilizers, fixators, whatever. They're there to sort of support the body and stabilize it while the agonists and the synergists and the antagonists are actually creating all this like motion. They're there to kind of stabilize everything and hold it in place. Right. So like your abs, you know, abdominal complex, that's a great example of a stabilizer because it's holding your spine in place while you're doing these squats, right? You can think of this as like Alfred the butler. He's providing emotional support, tea and crumpets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, so that's, he's there to help, right? Now here's the thing. If I am saying elbow, and we call this flexion, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my agonist is the bicep. And I've got synergists in like my forearms and I've got stabilizers in like my rotator cuff. And I've got an antagonist in my tricep. But if I do elbow extension, which flexion and extension are opposites of one another, suddenly this bicep is no longer the agonist. Now it's an antagonist. And the agonist is my triceps, right? Oh, yeah, so sense. everything, it, you know, it's not like the pectoralis major which is your pecs, right? Is always the agonist. Sometimes it's a synergist, right? Like for instance, during a shoulder press, the agonist is your delta, but you actually have these fibers at the top of your pecs that do a little bit of that. They, they're there to help, right? There's a little bit. Meanwhile, my lats, which pull my arm down this way during like a pull-up action, right? That's an antagonist to the shoulder press. So when you're looking, the reason this is so important, we look at somebody who has bad posture, right? Let's say I got rounded shoulders, right? Let's say I've got really bad rounded shoulders like this, right? Well, what's happening? I'm rounding my body away around this way. So what agonist pulls me this way? My pectoralis major. Yeah. Right? So what do I need to do? I need to relax that agonist and I need to strengthen this muscle's antagonist which is like my rhomboids and posterior deltoids. So I need to strengthen the muscles that go this way and I need to stretch this muscle here. And this is why we need to know which agonists do which joint actions. And that's what the second half of this course is gonna be. After the midterm, we're gonna dive into the foot and ankle complex. And we're gonna say what muscle moves the ankle this way and what move, muscle moves the ankle this way, what moves it this way, what moves it this way, you know, that, that. We're gonna look at what muscles are doing which things. And we need to be able to analyze like, hey, your ankle doesn't move the way it's supposed to because this agonist is tight because its antagonist is weak. So I need to stretch that and I need to strengthen that. And that's why it's so important to have these relationships pretty clear in the head. What's the op or, or when they're synergists? Sometimes it's not even an agonist antagonist thing. Sometimes you'll get Robin coming in and he's trying to fight everybody. That man's over there like, I can't do what I'm supposed to do. You know, it's like, you're getting in my way, you know? Sometimes synergists will take over. Me, that's a good example. The reason my hamstring's acting up is it, my hamstrings love to do too much work. They, my hamstrings are really overactive. They love to do work when my glutes are supposed to be doing all this work. And yeah. my Robin takes over for my Batman. You know, my glutes can't do what it's supposed to do because my freaking hamstrings are so tight. So it's like a lot of times I got to like turn my hamstrings up before I go work out so that my glute gets the attention that it needs. Um, and when I skip my cool downs, uh, yeah, I pay for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very important to cool down. Uh, right. So here's some examples. Um, you can see, like, I picked some of the key movements. I picked, like, the chest press. Your pec is the agonist. But during a chest press, the anterior delta and the triceps are, are, are synergists. Uh, meanwhile, during the chest press, you know, your rotator cuff is a stabilizer. And during a chest press, your posterior deltoid is an antagonist. Uh, if we are describing, like, a rowing motion, your lats are the agonist. Um, your posterior deltoid and your biceps are, are synergists. 
your rotator cuff is still going to be a, a stabilizer there. Um, and then your pecs are an antagonist in this moment. Um, so there's some examples in here that you can take a look at. Um, yeah. And then all this information uh, is going to be, you know, in general on 44 for through 46. They're, like I said, understanding the actual agonists and antagonists and stuff, um, that's going to take a little bit of time uh, to kind of get memory. That's why we have a, a, a week dedicated to that in the second half of this course. Um, so if you take a look at today's lesson on Canvas, by the way, um, I do want to take a look here and show you. Um, if you take a look at Canvas, you will see, I put a little note down at the bottom. So you'll see like the video, the PowerPoints, and then uh, you'll see, I just left a little note down here. If you guys really want to see how muscles grow, which is not really the focus of this course, um, you know, our, you know, not that we don't want to know how muscles grow and stuff. Um, but if you want to like talk about like, you know, hypertrophy growth, right. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with how we move. Uh, watch this video right here. Just copy this link and go to YouTube. Um, this is that Australian guy that I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> the heck? Oh, it's cruel. What am I saying? Uh, this guy will actually break down why are, you know, what we see in our myofibrils um, and how to create more of them. But it's a 20, it's a 20 minute video, um, pretty lengthy, but he'll go over, he'll review the anatomy first, kind of similar to how I did today. Um, yeah. And then he'll actually get into the growth stuff at the end. Uh, but what he'll talk about, and I'll just mention this briefly, um, but like Mir, you're talking about like drawing more fluid into this muscle to make it bigger that way. Um, yeah. That is one way to grow muscles. Um, but the other way is to make more proteins within the muscles. So you'll see the okay. difference between what is called sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is muscle growth, by the way. Yeah. Um, and then you will see myofibrillar hypertrophy. You'll see both of these things. They look a little bit different from one another. Um, but here's a, a diagram kind of representing the difference. So here's a normal muscle fiber. It's got four proteins in it, and it's about this big. Now, if we just made the cell bigger, we draw more fluid in there, that's yeah. sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, right? But yeah. if we also just stacked more proteins in there, that's myofibrillar hypertrophy. Now, this is really good at mm -hmm. generating energy because now there's all this like cellular fluid to create energy, right? Yeah. Um, and then this is really good at being strong because there's more proteins to contract more stuff. Yeah. Okay. So what do we want? Well, we, we kind of want to blend, you know, let's get them. Yeah. I, I was thinking like, if I take one scoop of protein, it's like 30 grams. And then I only drink it with like, I don't know, maybe like 400 milligrams of water. It would be better to like drink more of both, I guess. But I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know where I'm getting. It honestly comes down to your training too, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I work, bro, I work out as hard as I can until my back and knees start hurting. <laughs> and then I just yeah. stop. Gosh. Yeah. So yeah, this style of training is usually like high repetition, mm -hmm. like, or like moderate repetition. Um, yeah. That draw, you know, which means like you need lots of energy. So your body will go, oh, well, we need more energy. So then I'll make the stuff, yeah. the fluid that creates that energy. This version over here is like, you know, so I like to think of this as like type 2A, type 2X. Um, that's not perfect analogy, but but that's sort of how I, you know. Which one did you say type 2A? Uh, 2A is over here. Okay. Like this is a like the athlete, right? Yeah. Um, and then this is the power lifter. Power lifter. The right. X, right? Yeah. The two X is power, yeah. X is extreme, bro. X is extreme. <laughs> 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 Um, okay. look at that 10 30 on the dot. Um, so, uh, that is pretty much your guide to muscles. We're going to start shifting gears here. We're starting, you're going to start labeling movements. Um, we got a lot of terminology coming over the next two days. Um, and then, uh, we're meeting up on Tuesday guys. We'll get a chance to, to run down to Sochi and, and practice some of these movements that we're going to start talking about. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Yeah. No, uh, no homework today. No homework today. Just read those pages if you can. 
This is, oh, yeah. that's the end of chapter. Uh, yeah, that's the end of chapter two. Uh, okay. So by now, over the next three days, we, we've, we've killed chapter two. Um, you know, so try to get through most of that. Uh, the page numbers are listed in the PowerPoints and stuff, but yeah. Okay. And then for the, uh, what is the trial, trial guide? Just kind of like get the use of just like getting familiar with what we're talking about with pictures yeah. and stuff like that. And then mostly all the stuff is going to be on the uh, NASA book, right? Yeah, your priority will always be the NASA book. Okay. Remember, okay. like, you know, this nine months is meant to be more than just the NASA book, but you got to pass your test, you know, so and like the test is out of the book. Yeah, true. We've got other books that we give you, you know, like that Memler's book is really great. Um, the trail guide is really great. But like your priority should always be uh, that for all those push-ups, you know. All right. <laughs> cool, cool. And so this cool. Uh, NASA. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go, go, go for it. Uh, the the exam blueprint. I can start looking at that now, huh? And just looking yeah. at it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mo's gonna give it to you. Um, but yeah, it's on the internet. Take a look at it. just N Google NASA exam blueprint. Um, yeah. Just start getting familiar with it. You know. Um, yeah. Like I said, my job is actually not necessarily test prep. My job is foundational. Um, yeah, so you don't even necessarily prep. need to look at that until you meet Mo. Um, <laughs> but it certainly can't hurt, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's and I only show you the first page. It's got several pages where it actually goes over what topics in particular. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I think it's like seven pages. But. All right, let me kill the recording here.